morning. Mor <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, Started to get some questions over the weekend, which means people are starting to do some work, which is good. Got one, uh, one question about uh, reading, reading the mouse in a thread and synchronizing it. Did synchronizing fix the... We haven't tried it. Okay. Um, my guess is the, 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 the threads, these threads are, are executing quickly. And if you have the life updater running in one thread and your mouse reader right running in another thread, then your chances of missing an array element are fairly good. Could you estimate what the probability was of missing an array element? Was it Probably one in 100? No, lot, lot, one in maybe 10. One in 10. So what I think the answer is, is if you decide to thread lab one, there's no reason to thread lab one except for cleanness of implementation, which is, which is elegant. But in terms of performance, there's no reason to. Let me put it that way. And if you decide to thread it, though, you will have to use a mutex or a semaphore to lock the array when you're doing the mouse modification. So if the mouse actually gets bytes, you lock the array, modify the, uh, the life array, then unlock it again. And the update code on the, in the other thread is going to have to lock the array when, when doing a write to the array and unlock it again when it's done writing. Probably should lock it when it does the read, too. So, so you're going to have to worry about explicit thread synchronization very soon if you do any threading at all. There's another question. Um, there, there are a few peripherals on the HPS side. For instance, there is one switch and one LED and most of the other peripherals are managed by Linux and you don't want to mess with them in terms of register manipulation. But the switch and the LED are not managed by Linux. You can do direct memory map writes to, or reads to read the switch and light the LED. But there's only one LED and one switch. Why bother? Use the, use the FPGA side. Don't worry about the HPS peripherals. I have to say, I spent five days trying to blink the damn LED on the HPS and never got it to blink. I never got it to light. This is, this is frustrating for somebody who is used to blinking LEDs, right? And since then, in fact, in the last week, I think I figured out the reason, but I haven't tested it yet. It turns out that in QSys, you have that HPS system up there on the, on the bus structure. If you double click that, it opens up a panel with about a thousand options. One of which is to enable I.O. Oh! And so I, when I was doing the, the, doing the setup initially, naively, I was thinking of this as a standalone microcontroller. When in fact, the peripherals of this microcontroller are mostly mapped into the FPGA. It is in fact a big microcontroller, big microcontroller, ARM9, but all of the FPGAs are mapped, I.O. lines are mapped into the FPGA and so everything can be turned on and off. It's not like hard hardware. Any other questions from over the weekend? Anthony, there's something you wanted me to say. I forgot what it was. Career fair, Wednesday. Probably, 
probably many of you are going to have to make a decision about whether to come to class or go to the career fair. I think the answer is obvious on that. Jobs are important. Uh, I'm not sure what I should talk about, that what I will talk about. That might be P threads, but in any case, the lecture will be on video notes. So um, watch it when you get the chance. If you don't, if you can't come to lecture, if you, if you're, uh, if you're out flogging your uh, your resume, that's important. Now. Maybe it's worthwhile just saying, let's just skip it. How many people expect to be here on Wednesday? Oh, that's enough. I'll, I'll talk. Okay. I want to talk some more about QSYS today and then give another example of a bus master. And I want to talk more about QSYS in terms of the modules that are available to you, predefined to use. Because when I said parallel I, when you I said something like when you drop a parallel I/O port onto QSYS, and I saw you know everybody's attention went clank over to what's he talking about? So I thought I'd go through some of the available modules that are predefined and ready to load up on QSYS, and. There's, a couple, there's several resources, all of which are rather heavy reading. One is the Embedded IP Users Guide. And then a whole bunch of very specific uh, peripheral uh, descriptions. But has any of you opened QSYS and looked at the bus at all? Live? Yeah. On, on, uh, you need to do that. And in the upper left corner of the of the uh, design space of the user interface, there's a library of functions that are available. The hierarchy is at least three levels deep. It's kind of organized in a, in a strange fashion. There's duplicates of, say, UART modules in at least two places, of SPI modules in at least two places. They appear to be the same, I think. But <clears throat> there are some modules which are listed, but that you don't have access to because we haven't bought them. So the ones that are highlighted, the ones that you can click on, we have, we have a license for. And, and the university program, we have license for the whole thing. But in particular, I decided I'd go through and try and lay out where, where in this menu system you find certain objects. And then a little bit about the about how you add them. So in the library uh, processors and peripherals, the, it, there's coprocessors, embedded processors, and hard processors. And it turns out that the HPS is a, is a ARM9 hard. And so that's what you want to click if you want to put an HPS onto the menu, onto the bus. Because it is a hardcore, you can't put two of them on there. There's only one on the chip. Now, the, under the embedded processor menu, there's a NIOS 2 microcontroller, which is a MIPS-like uh, CPU. In fact, it's very similar to the PIC32 we used in 4760, except uh, a little slower, maybe. and. You can put as many of those on the chip as you want. I suggest using zero because if you use uh, the NIOS 2, it is yet another C uh, tool chain you have to learn. 
And the Cyclone 5 hard processor reference manual is a wonderful document that's about 1,200 pages long. It has everything in it, if only you can find it. So mostly we're going to abstract that away because it's hidden under Linux. One thing you're going to certainly use, though, is a parallel I.O. port. And I just highlighted that with orange in, in, uh, so that I could find it again when I was pointing at it. But under peripherals, there's a thing called a parallel I.O. port. It can be configured, but you double click it, you drag it out onto the bus, you double click it. It can be configured 1 bit to 32 bits. It can be configured output only, input only, or both. It uh, is going to be how you communicate to your bus master from the HPS. So the HPS is going to write to the parallel I.O. port, which will then command your bus master to set up certain features like parameters and computation rates. Then your bus master will feed back onto the bus to tell the HP or to tell some other peripheral like the video interface what to draw. So you're going to be using parallel IOs a lot. There seems to be two different versions. There's the embedded IP user's guide and there's the university program parallel I.O. I would read this because it's on the order of pages instead of on the order of hundreds of pages. It tells how to instantiate the core and QSYS builder. It tells what it looks like and what uh, ports are available on it. And, but the main thing you're going to need as a programmer is the parallel port register map. You're going to assign this an address on QSYS, which will then be mapped and then connect the parallel I.O. port to the lightweight, except for instance, the lightweight bus on the HPS. The lightweight bus will prepend FF20 on to the address you choose for the parallel I.O. port and that will be the I.O. address that you use from a program running on the HPS. So, but once you get the base address of the parallel I.O. port, the offset in bytes is the, the offset zero is reads or writes data. Offset one offset uh, one word up, 32 bits up, sets the data direction. So is the bit an input bit or an output bit? You can um, optionally turn on interrupts. I haven't messed with this because I am not sure enough of my Linux skills to embed an interrupt handler into the kernel yet. But some of you are probably more familiar with that than I am and willing to do that. And after all, what's the worst that can happen? You, you blow the SD card and you, pro, and you flash another one. Which reminds me, as soon as you have the SD card set up the way you like it, with the SSH stuff on it and everything and the right IP address, back it up. Copy it back on to your, keep an image on your, on your laptop because you will blow these, these drives. And then you'll start over if you haven't backed up. Back up. There's UART. There's a, a, ser a serial port on the, on the board. There's, a, there's UART uh, uh, IP that you can, you can add. There's SPI uh, modules. There is some pretty obscure documentation about RAMs and FIFOs. And the reason it's obscure is that the, the FIFO documentation 
This is for M10K blocks, which are the memory blocks on the, on the, on the Cyclone 5. So that the FIFO documentation is written for and designed for QSYS, but the RAM documentation has yet to be updated and still seems to point to SOPC Builder, which is the old version, and all the names are different. So I think the way you're going to learn to use on-chip RAM is to grab a module, put it onto the bus, and wire it up. <clears throat> then there's a bunch of special functions that are available, a whole bunch of DSP functions that I hi or in which I highlighted some of the more useful uh, modules. There's a, a predefined cascaded integrator comb filter. This is a fairly low performance low pass filter. Low performance in the sense that the cutoff is not very sharp but it has the advantage that all of the coefficients of the FIR filter are one. That means you don't have to do any multiplies it's a running average, it's an optimized running average that is used almost exclusively for downsampling. So you put in a sample, you put in a signal at, at 48 kilohertz at the, at the native audio sampling rate of the, of the codec and all you care about is voice which has a bandwidth of three and a half kilohertz if you're going to design filters for voice, it makes much more sense to downsample a factor of 6 to 8 kilohertz and then write your, your filters to run at 8 kilohertz. But to do that, you need to first low pass filter the signal so that you don't get aliasing. And the CIC would be what you would use to do that. <clears throat> There's a general finite impulse response filter. I've written a number of infinite impulse response filter configurations for this architecture and uh, uh, also a uh, direct digital synthesis numerically controlled oscillator. However, there's also an NCO module, numerically controlled oscillator module for those of you who prefer to use a CAN software. There's an FFT generator that I have not messed with and a 2D FF FIR for doing image convolution filtering of images. That's cool. In the university program, there's the UART, there's the audio core which we're going to be using a lot, there's the video core which you're already using in lab one, there's an ADC controller that reaches out, does all of the interfacing to the analog to digital converter that exists on this board. I think it's a seven, eight channel ADC, one mega sample per second. A good final project would be to make a power monitor for the board. So instead of plugging the power supply directly into the board, you plug the power supply into your power monitor. The power monitor is then sitting uh, the analog uh, current measurement is converted to a voltage and then applied to the ADC and then the FPGA reads the ADC and decides how much power it's drawing. So you can do real-time monitoring of power on the device itself. The board has an accelerometer on it so that if you pick it up and shake it, it knows it. I'm not sure why that's there exactly. And then the device we've already talked about and are going to use a tremendous amount is a bus master. Any question about these modules? They're pretty straightforward. If you if you want if you if you want to pull a, if you want to hook an HPS module a, a, a parallel I/O up to the HPS, you drop a parallel I/O on there. You take the bus slave connection 
and you drag it up to the lightweight HPS bus master, you're done. It's wired. Oh, it needs a clock and a reset. It's extremely simple to set up. And we'll talk more about individual pieces of this as, as appropriate. But I thought I would try and at least document on the, on the user interface where you find this stuff. So in the university program, oh, there's a 16 by 2 character display interface. So for character only liquid crystal displays, this board doesn't happen to have one. But it does have the header for it. So if you wanted to put it on the board, you actually have to take the plexiglass cover off and put the display underneath the plex cover. Don't do that without chatting with me first. Audio and video config is really handles an I2C bus. There's an I2C master. I didn't document it. I can if you want. Here are the bridges you're going to be using. There's clocks that are available. And when in doubt, use the devices that are in the, in the university subset because the documentation is easier to follow. It's meant to be taught from as opposed to design some mega system from. So there's various useful controllers. Uh, including a USB controller. Unfortunately, what's defined here is only the lowest level. It's only the fizz level of the USB. And so all of the other levels you have to write yourself on the HPS unless you can find a driver that will handle it. <clears throat> if you instantiate a NIOS microcontroller, there's a pre-written driver that will handle the USB. And all these interactions are, design, are, 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 are um, talked about in the documentation which you get to by right-clicking not by right-clicking this. <clears throat> so if you right-click on the RS-232 UART link, you'll get two things. It'll, there'll be one, one, one option, which is insert onto bus. And the other option is documentation. You follow that link and you will get two sublinks which are data sheet or component folder. And one of the two of those, and it varies from module to module, either the data sheet or the component folder will have the documentation for the module. And as usual, these things are easier once you sit down and play with it. But are there any questions? So let's go back and talk about bus masters again. Unless there's some questions on lab one. Did anybody figure out a way of, of moving the cursor without rewriting the array on screen? So, you, Anthony, you, you, you actually did rewrite a small patch, didn't you? 
So what I'm wondering is, is there a way of defining an, a graphic overlay that has the cursor in it, but not the graphics itself? I haven't been able to figure one out, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. One way to do it would be to define custom characters and change them on the fly and use the characters as an overlay for the, for the, for the, for the cursor, but that's too horrible to think about. So, let's go back then and talk about audio filtering a little bit, <clears throat> because <clears throat> it's a good example of, of, of a bus master, not because I'm particularly talking about filtering right now. And I had already built a bunch of filters because I like DSP. And so I wanted to use the filters as a way of exercising my understanding of whether I had the bus master right or not for, for the audio interface. So again, the, the very first thing we do in, in the interface is to define the audio base addresses for, like we did last time. But then I'm going to map the write audio output either to a filter output or to the write audio input and, the, and use the other switch, another switch to switch between output and input. This is so I can do A-B comparisons and see if my filter was working. And uh, because the frequency response of the audio interface is not flat, the only way to make sure that my filter was correct was to measure the input and output and take the ratio of them. So I need to be able to do both. This is a petrified piece of code that's not necessary for this. This uh, does a direct digital synthesis for injecting a sine wave into the system in case you want to do uh, uh, sine synthesis. The only way I could figure out what the bus master was doing, whether I was ever even close to correct when I was writing the bus master, was to expose the bus control signals onto GPIO pins. You've got four, 36, 72 I.O. pins. You may as well use them. You can only look at two at a time on the oscilloscope, but it's better than nothing. So, I brought out four of the, uh, of, the, of the bus control pins, write, read, act, and a synchronization signal I was generating internally, which is audio data ready, and put them on GPIO pins. Now, folks, when you hook to the GPIO pins, under no circumstances, you take the little clippy things on the end of the oscilloscope leads and hook them to the pins because you will short them and two shorted pins are two dead pins so you will use jumpers to jump out of the header to a place where you can clip on safely and the first time you do this if you have any doubt what I'm talking about ask me don't just hook it up But this is a nice way to debug. This is I, when I was playing around with bus masters, putting two bus masters on the on the bus and firing them both at the same time, saying right, 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 both of you right at the same time, right, 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 right. I wanted to see what would happen. And what happens is the bus arbiter makes them alternate, so you can you can ask for simultaneous rights, and the bus arbiter will arbitrarily take one return an ACK, at which time the other one then gets an ACK back, and they just start alternating. And it works just exactly the way it should. 
but I had to prove that to myself by watching the the ACK, the 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 bus write request and the bus ACK feedback. Because I never I don't believe anything in hardware until I see it. So then the 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 actual infinite impulse response filter definition. Oh, let's see, it's IIR2, two, two poles, 18-bit fixed point. And that is some ugly coefficients. There's, there are three B coefficients and two A coefficients for a two-pole filter. This is using um, MATLAB terminology, direct form type 2, which is what everybody uses in MATLAB. And the interesting thing is that to make a negative component, to make a negative constant, you put the negative sign outside of all of the other designators. So this is a negative 18-bit signed decimal. And if you do that, if you put the the symbols in that order, then it takes this positive number, converts it to hex, sine extends it, and stores it as an 18-bit. So I tried every possible permutation of negatives and signed and because the documentation didn't make sense. But this is what works. So <clears throat> uh, the audio synchronization occurs down here when there's an input ready this this filter calculates one output signal one output value and then freezes until the next audio signal because the state clock is running at 50 megahertz and this filter has about uh, 10 states so it's done in a fifth of a millisecond a microsecond or so not an efficient use of the FPGA, it's an easy use. <coughs> well, that's some pretty ugly code, but I wrote a utility which generates that ugly code in Homely MATLAB. So down here at the bottom of the file as a comment is the MATLAB program that generates the formatted Verilog. And it does the, it does the f float to fix 16 conversion. It formats the negative numbers by explicitly detecting the sign of the number. It does all that stuff for you. So you can fairly easily design a MATLAB filter by specifying the two cutoff frequencies. This happens to be a Butterworth filter. It's two poles because MATLAB automatically says if you want one pole but you give two cutoff frequencies, you get two poles. There's the frequency and the bandwidth of the thing. And it generates the filter and then spits out a Verilog header for it. And then obviously, someplace down in the file, you have to actually define the filter, which is here. This is the direct form type 2 transpose from MATLAB. And that's what's calculated in the state machine. So then to go back to, but now to go back to the, the, the bus master aspect of this. Once again, I'm going through this again because I had the feeling Friday that it didn't take. And it probably won't this time, but repetition does help. So we're, I'm uh, resetting the state machine here, which means setting an audio FIFO address and then uh, uh, that's actually not reset.
reset sets all of the reads and writes to zero. The first state in the state machine asks to read the FIFO, sets up a bus read, sets all the byte selects on, so you're reading the whole width of the thing. And then you wait for the bus ACK in the next site in the next state of the state machine. You wait for the bus ACK. When the bus ACK is true, then the data can be read off the data bus. It's shifted 24 because that happens to be the format in which it's stored in the FIFO address description. That tells us how much FIFO space there is and then we're done reading. So the basic, the basic structure of the read is to set up an address, wait for the ACK, read the result. Making sense? Yes? Yeah. <clears throat> When there's room in the FIFO, so in the next state, if, the, if there's sufficient space in the FIFO, then we set up to write the left address with the left address, with the left uh, data. And if there's no room, we just toss everything and, and try again later. So the bus write is only commanded if there is space. If the bus write is commanded, then we have to wait for the ACK and then set the bus write back to zero. So for a write cycle, you set the data and the address. You ask, you set the write command, the write line. You wait for the ACK, and at that point, the data is written wherever it has to go. You don't know how many cycle bus cycles that took. Could take several bus cycles if there's lots of stuff going on on the bus. But when the act comes back, you know it's done. So to make this a little more then concrete, let's ask, what are you actually going to do on lab two? What you're actually going to do on lab two is you're going to write for a given transaction at a given time step in the simulation, you're going to write one point on this waveform to the VGA you're going to wait for the ACK, then you're going to write the equivalent point on the second waveform to the VGA uh, display buffer. And then you're going to wait for some length of time determined by the simulation, and then write another pair of points. So the simulator is going to be running at something like uh, a step size of 2 to the minus 9 which means it's going to take about two to the ninth <coughs> steps to produce one radian of output. So it's going to take about 6.2 times ten, two to the ninth time steps to do one cycle. And you are surely not going to want to write 3,000 3, points during that time. You're going to want to write 20 points. So you're going to be doing a lot of calculation of intermediate results and then downsampling the simulator to put it onto the VGA. But every time you write a point, you're going to be addressing a bus master who, which is, whose address is pointed at the VGA display. So that's what you're going to be doing. And what you're going to have to do is to write the simulator for this. Now, 
I'm not going to just throw you throw you over the wall completely on this. I wrote a simulate. I wrote a, a basic structure that will do numerical integration and multiplication and a few other common items, so that solving a, a, a set of differential equations is equivalent to wiring together predefined modules. Now there's some details that make it interesting, but, but that's the basic piece of lab two. Uh, last year one of the groups split the VGA screen into two pieces Two of the TAs did this last year. They split it into two pieces. The HPS drew the top third of the display. The VGA uh, bus master drew the bottom two thirds. And the top third was an animation of the springs and the masses going back and forth across the screen. And the bottom third were the waveforms I actually asked for. Since the VGA exists on the QSIS bus, an arbitrary bus master and the HPS can both write to the screen, and the writes are synchronized by the bus. So there's no interference between them. That's pretty cool. In particular, what you're going to find is you probably won't do the animation. There's no extra credit for doing the animation, although it's kind of interesting to watch. Uh, but what you will find out is that it's quite useful for debugging and for setting parameters to be able to put text on the screen. And that will be handled by the HPS. So the text generator will be manipulated by the HPS and the V and the graphics planes will be handled by the bus master that you write. <clears throat> now I'm going to go over in some detail the uh, oh yeah Here's the eigen, the eigen modes. Remember the words eigen modes? Oh, you diagonalize a matrix. Uh. Anyways, the eigen modes for this, let's say that all the springs have the, have the same stiffness. The eigen modes are the two masses move together and the middle spring doesn't change length. And the other eigen mode is the masses breathe and the, and the center of gravity stays constant. So this represents the in phase and the 180 degree out of phase eigen modes. <clears throat> since it, now here's the, here's the tidbit. This is completely irrelevant, but since it's a linear system, any solution is a linear combination of the eigen modes. Right? Is that, does that tickle a neuron from someplace back four years ago? <laughs> so that's enough for lab two right now. We'll talk more about that probably Friday. How far did people get on lab one? Finished? How many people finished? One, two, three. Did I see, miss some hands? Three? Thre only three, but three, okay. So, would you say then, for future years, that this is a two-week lab, not a three-week lab? Okay. Since I had no idea the level of sophistication of Linux users or, or or anything else for this new hardware, I, I made the first lab generous. Finish soon, start lab two. Don't wait. Lab two's hard. 
What else? We've got five minutes. Let's talk about final projects. It's not too early. We're, not, we're only in lab one, but it's only uh, what five weeks away that you have to have a proposal. And so start thinking about what would you use, well use, the HPS and the FPGA together. Could you run OpenCV on this distribution, for instance, with some of the image processing being done on the FPGA back end? I have no idea. Could, uh, could you get enough performance out of the whole system to make a completely animated Mandelbrot fly through? So completely animated means 60 frame a second update. Um, zoomable, panable with the mouse. Now you have to be able to do three dimensional. So you have to go back and forth. You have to have a center of rendering. And then you also have to have a magnification. So it might take two mice. Or, <clears throat> or a mouse and two buttons for zoom in and zoom out or maybe slow zoom, fast zoom. Um, could you do real-time video compositing? Could you do a real-time SLAM algorithm where you extract depth from an image on the fly on the FPGA? Stereo vision. What kind of game would you like to play on a, on a device with some stomping big CPU and a, and a parallel coprocessor? Gravitational space wars. I, games are fine with me. I like games. Games, to make a good game, requires some seriously hard programming. One year, one group use the VGA code DAC. The VGA DAC has, after all, a red, a green, and a blue channel, each one of which can digitize at 150 megahertz or so. That's plenty of bandwidth to produce three NTSC full-color television signals. Therefore, you could hook three monitors to it, three television monitors to the one VGA connector and play a three-way game where everybody has their own view of the game field with extraordinarily high bandwidth between the, between the displays. Would that be fun? They, did, they, they spent so much time getting the, the, the video signal right that they ended up play, uh, making Battleship, which was good. It's a two-person display. It requires two displays. But it doesn't use the, the huge bandwidth very well. How about a 3D renderer? How about a nice polygon renderer? How about a ray tracer? Ooh, a parallel ray tracer. <sighs> What's the bottleneck on a parallel ray tracer? Anybody tried to build a parallel ray tracer? In a, in a graphics ray tracer, every ray is, is, is completely independent of every other ray. Just as in real life, every light ray is independent of every other light ray because light doesn't interact very strongly with itself. In fact, very small. So that says that the system should be parallelly tri tri <coughs> trivially parallelizable because every ray is completely independent. But there's a serial bottleneck. And that's the database of objects you have to render. And so if you can figure out a way of, of parallelizing that, and clearly people have because GPUs work, <clears throat> that would be fun to do. Make a nice high quality mirrored surface ray tracer. Yeah. Graphics is fun. Audio is fun. You could. <coughs> 
you have enough bandwidth on this on this chip to do a all all hundred and seventy or so strings of a piano simultaneously. Anyway, start thinking. I will see some of you next time. Good luck at the job fair.